from around the globe. It's the Cube covering Google Cloud next on Air 20. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman, and this is the Cube's coverage of Google Cloud Next. Happy to welcome back to the program one of our Cube alumni, Clayton Coleman. He's the architect for Kubernetes and OpenShift with Red Hat. Clayton, thanks for joining us again. Great to see you. Great to see you. All right, so of course, one of the challenges in 2020 is we love to be able to get the community together. And while we can't do it physically, we do get to do it through all of the virtual events and online forums. Of course, you know, we had the Cube at Red Hat Summit, uh, KubeCon uh, for the European show, and now Google Cloud. So, you know, first give us kind of your, your state of the state, 2020, Kubernetes, of course, it was Google uh, taking the technology from Borg, a few people working on it, and, you know, just that this project that has just had massive impact uh, on IT. So, you know, where are we with the community in, in Kubernetes today? So, uh, you know, 2020 has been a, a crazy year for a lot of folks. Um, a lot of what I've been spending my time on is um, you know, taking feedback from people who, you know, in this time of you know, change and concern and worry and huge shift to the cloud, um, working with them to make sure that we have a really good um, you know, foundation in Kubernetes and that the ecosystem is healthy and that things are moving forward there. So there's a ton of exciting projects. I will say, you know, the, the pandemic's had a, an impact on, um, you know, the community. And so in many places we've reacted by slowing down our schedules or focusing more on the things that people are really worried about, like quality and bugs and making sure that the stuff just works. Uh, I will say this year has been a really interesting one in open source. There's been much more focus, I think, on how we start to tie this stuff together um, and new use cases and new challenges coming into um, what maybe you know, the original Kubernetes was very focused on helping you bring stuff together, bring your applications together and giving you common abstractions for working with them. Um, we went through a, a phase where we made it easy to extend Kubernetes, which brought a whole bunch of new abstractions in. And I think now we're starting to see the challenges and the needs of organizations and companies and individuals that are getting out of, um, not just in Kubernetes, but across multiple locations, across placement edge has been huge in the last few years. And so the projects in and around Kubernetes are kind of reacting to that. They're starting to um, bridge um, many of these um, you know, disparate locations, um, different clouds, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, um, connecting enterprises to data centers or connecting data centers to the cloud, um, helping workloads be a little bit more portable in and of themselves, but helping workloads move. And then I think you know, we're, we're really starting to ask those next big questions about what comes what comes next for making applications um, really come alive in the cloud, um, where you're not as focused on the hardware, you're not as focused on the details, but you're focused on abstractions like, um, you know, reliability and availability, not just in one cluster, but in multiple. So th that's been a really exciting uh, transition in many of the projects that I've been following, you know, certainly projects like Istio has been dealing with, um, you know, spanning clusters and connecting existing workloads in. And um, you know, each step along the way, I see people starting to broaden their scope about what they want uh, open source to help them solve. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been fascinating to watch just the, the breadth of the projects that can tie in and leverage Kubernetes. Uh, you brought up edge computing and want to get into some of the future pieces, but before we do, you know, let's look at Kubernetes itself, uh, you know, 1.19, is kind of where we are at. Uh, um, I already see some so some threads talking about 1.20. Uh, can you just talk about the, the the base project itself, contributions to it, how the upstream uh, works, and you know how how should customers think about you know their Kubernetes environment? Obviously, you know Red Hat with OpenShift had a very strong position. You've got thousands of customers now using it. All of the cloud providers have their uh, Kubernetes flavor, but also you partner with them. So. Walk us through a little bit about you know, the open source, the project, and those dynamics. The project is really healthy, I think. Um, we've gone through a couple of big transitions over the last few years. We've moved from the original, um, you know, I was on the bootstrap steering committee trying to help the governance model. The full bootstrap committee, 
committee has handed off responsibility to um, new participants. There's been a lot of growth in the project governance and community governance. Um, I think there's huge credit to the folks on the steering committee today, folks part of contributor experience and standardizing and formalizing Kubernetes as its own thing. I think we've really moved into being a community managed project. Um, we've developed a lot of maturity around that and Kubernetes and the folks involved in helping uh, Kubernetes be successful have actually been able to help others within the CNCF ecosystem and other open source projects outside of CNCF be successful. So that angle is going phenomenally well. Uh, contribution is up. I think one of the tension points that we've talked about is um, Kubernetes is maturing. 119 spent a lot of time on stability. And while there's definitely lots of interesting new things in a few areas like storage, and we have service V2 and ingress V2 coming up on the horizon, dual stack support's been hotly anticipated by a lot of um, on-premise folks looking to make the transition to IPv6. I think we've been a little bit less focused on um, chasing features and more focused on just making sure that Kubernetes is maturing responsibly. Now that we have a really successful ecosystem of integrators and vendors and um, you know unification, the conformance efforts in Kubernetes, um, there have been some great work. I happen to be involved in the um, in the architecture conformance definition group, and there's been some amazing participation from um, um, from that group of people who've made real strides in growing the the testing efforts so that you know not only can you look at um, two different Kubernetes vendors, but you can compare them in meaningful ways. That's actually helped us with our test coverage in Kubernetes. Um, there's been a lot of focus on um, really spending time on making sure that upgrades work well, that we've reduced the flakiness of our test suites, and that when a contributor comes into Kubernetes, they're not presented with a confusing mass of instructions, but they have a really clear path to make their first contribution and their next contribution and then the one after that. So uh, from a project maturity standpoint, I think 2020 has been a great uh, great year for the project and I want to see that continue. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the things we talked quite a bit about uh, at both, both Red Hat Summit as well as uh, the KubeCon, Cloud Native Con Europe uh, was operators and you know maybe I, I believe there was some updates also about how operators can work with Google Cloud so can you give us that update sure there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of growth in both the client tooling and the libraries and the frameworks um, that make it easy to integrate with kubernetes um, and those integrations are about patterns that um, make operations teams uh, more productive but it, it takes time to develop the domain expertise in uh, operationalizing large groups of software. So over the last year, um, you know, the controller runtime project, uh, which is an outgrowth of um, the Kubernetes uh, SIG API machinery. So it's kind of a, an outshoot that's intended to standardize and make it easier to write integrations to Kubernetes. That next step of, um, you know, going then past that, Red Hat's worked uh, with um, others in the community around um, the operator SDK, uh, which unifying that project and trying to get it aligned with others in the ecosystem. Um, almost all of the cloud providers um, have written operators. Google's been an early adopter of the controller and operator pattern uh, and have continued to um, put time and effort into helping make the community be successful. And um, we're really appreciative of everyone who's come together to take some of those ideas from Kubernetes to extend them into um, whether it's running databases and service on top of Kubernetes or whether it's integrating directly with the cloud. Um, most of that work or almost all of that work benefits um, everybody in the ecosystem. Um, I think there's some you know, future work that we'd like to see around um, you know, uh, folks uh, from um, a number of places have gone even further and tried to boil Kubernetes down into simpler mechanisms um, that you can integrate with. So a little bit more of a uh, beginner's approach or a, a simplification, a domain specific uh, operator kind of idea that um, actually really does accelerate people getting up to speed with um, you know, building these sorts of integrations. But at the end of the day, um, 
one of the things that I really see is the the increasing integration between the uh, public clouds and their Kubernetes on top of those clouds through capabilities that make everybody better off. So whether you're using a managed service um, you know, on a particular cloud or whether you're running um, the elements of that managed open source software using an open source operator on top of Kubernetes, um, there's a lot of abstractions that are really productive for admins. You might use the managed service for your production instances, but you wanna use um, throwaway um, database instances for developers. Um, and there's a lot of experimentation going on. So it's almost, it's almost really difficult to say what the most interesting part is. Um, operators is really more of an enabling technology. I'm really excited to see that increasing glue that makes automation and makes um, you know, DevOps teams um, more productive just because they can rely increasingly on open source or managed services offerings from you know the large cloud providers to work well together. Yeah, you had mentioned that uh, we're seeing all the other projects that are tying into Kubernetes, we're seeing Kubernetes going into broader use cases, things like edge computing. What from an architectural standpoint, you know, needs to be done to make sure that uh, Kubernetes can be used, you know, meets the performance, the simplicity um, in, in these various use cases. That's a that's a great question. There's a, a lot of complexity in some areas of what you might do in a large application deployment that don't make sense in um, edge deployments, but you get advantages from having a reasonably consistent environment. I think one of the challenges everybody's going through is what is that reasonable consistency? What are the tools? You know, one of the challenges, obviously, is is we have more and more clusters, and a lot of the approaches around edge involve, you know, whether it's a single cluster on a single machine in, um, you know, in a fairly beefy but uh, remote uh, computer uh, that you still need to keep in sync with your application deployment. Um, you might have a different life cycle for uh, the types of hardware that you're rolling out, you know, whether it's regional or whether it's tied to whether someone can go out to that particular site to even update the software. Sometimes it's connected, sometimes it isn't. So I think a need that is becoming really clear is there's a lot of abstractions missing above Kubernetes. Uh, and everyone's approaching this differently. We've got uh, GitOps and centralized config management. Um, we have uh, architectures where you know you, you boot up and you go check some remote cloud location for what you should be running. Um, I think there's some some productive abstractions that are that are, haven't been um, that haven't been explored sufficiently yet. That over the next couple of years. How do you treat a whole bunch of clusters as uh, a pool of compute where you're not really focused on the details of where a cluster is? Or how can you define applications that can easily move um, from your data center out to the edge or back up to the cloud, but get those benefits of Kubernetes in all those places? And it, the, the, the fascinating thing about this is we're so early that what I see in open source and what I see with um, people deploying this is everyone is approaching this subtly differently. Um, but you can start to see some of those patterns emerge where um, you need reproducible bundles of applications, um, things that Helm can do well, or you can do with uh, just very simply with Kubernetes. Um, not every edge location needs um, uh, an ingress uh, controller or a way to move traffic onto that cluster because their job is to generate traffic and send it somewhere else. But then that puts more pressure on, well, you need those where you're feeding that data to your APIs, whether that's a cloud or something within your uh, something within a, a private data center, you need um, enough of commonalities across those clusters and across your applications that you can reason about what's going on. So uh, there's a huge amount of uh, space here, and I don't think it's just going to be Kubernetes. In fact, I, I want to say I think we're starting to move to that phase where Kubernetes is just part of the platform that people are building or need to build? And what can we do to build those tools that help you stitch together, compute across a lot of footprints, um, parts of applications across a lot of footprints? And there's, there's a bunch of open source projects that are uh, trying to drive to that today. Um, projects like, like Istio and Knative um, with the work uh, being done with eventing in Knative. And obviously, eventing is a hugely, um, you know, we talk about edge. 
we'd almost be remiss not to talk about moving data. And you talk about moving data, well, you want streams of data and you want to be reactive to data with compute. And Knative and Istio are both um, great examples of technologies within the Cube ecosystem that are starting to broaden, um, you know, outside of the, well, this is just about one Cube cluster to, um, we really need to stitch together a mindset of development, even if we have a, a reasonably consistent Kubernetes across all those footprints. Yeah, well, Clayton, so important. There's so many technologies out there. It stops becoming about that technology and it's just a given. It's an underlying piece of it. You know, we don't talk about the internet. We, we don't talk, you know, as much about Linux anymore because it, it's just in the fabric of everything we do. Um, and it sounds like we're saying that's where we're getting with Kubernetes. Uh, I, I'd love to pull on that thread. You mentioned that you're hearing some patterns uh, starting to emerge out there. So when, when you're talking to enterprises, uh, especially if you're talking 2020, uh, lots of companies all of a sudden have to really accelerate uh, the, you know, those transformational projects that they were doing uh, so that they can move faster and, and keep up with the pace of change. Uh, so, you know, what should enterprise be, be working on? What feedback are you hearing from customers? Uh, what are some of those themes that you can share and what, what, what should everybody else be getting ready for? The, the most common pattern, I think, is that many people um, still find a need to build uh, platforms or um, standardization of how they do application development across fairly large footprints. Um, I think what they're missing, and this is what everyone's kind of building on their own today that um, is a real opportunity within the community is uh, abstract abstractions around location, not really about clusters or machines, but something broader than that, whether it's um, folks who need to be resilient across clouds, um, whether it's folks who are looking to bring together disparate footprints to accelerate their move to the cloud um, or to modernize um, their on-premise stack. They're looking for abstractions that are um, productive to say, I don't really want to worry too much about the details of clusters or machines or applications, but I'm talking about services and where they run. And then I need to stitch those into, um, I need to stitch those deeply into some environments, but not others. So that pattern um, has been something that we've been exploring for a long time within the community. So the Open Service Broker Project um, you know, has been a long running effort of trying to genericize one type of interface operators and some of the abstractions in Kubernetes for extending Kubernetes in new dimensions is another. Um, what I'm seeing is that people are building layers on top through continuous deployment, continuous integration, building their own APIs, building their own services that really hide these details. I think there's a really rich opportunity uh, within open source to uh, observe what's going on and to offer some supporting technologies that bridge clouds, bridge locations, um, let you deal with compute at a little bit more of an abstract level um, and really double down on making services run well. I think we're kind of ready to make the transition to say officially, it's not just about applications, which is what we've been saying for a long time. You know, I've got these applications and I'm moving them, but to flip it around and say, we want to be service focused and services have a couple of characteristics. Um, the details of where they run are more about the guarantees that you're providing for your customers. Um, we lack a lot of open source tools that um, make it easier to build and run services, not just to consume as dependencies or to run open source software, but what are the things that make uh, applications more resilient in and of themselves? I think Kubernetes was a good start. Um, I really see organizations struggling with that today. You're going to have multiple locations. You're going to have um, the need to dramatically move workloads. Um, what are the tools that the whole ecosystem, the open source ecosystem, um, can collaborate on and help accelerate that transition? Well, Clayton, you teed up uh, my, my last thing I want to ask you. You know, we're, we're here at the Google Cloud show, and when you talk about ecosystem, you talk about community, you know, Google and, and Red Hat, both very active participants in this community. So, you know, you, you peer, you collaborate with a lot of people from, from Google, I'm sure. So g give our audience a little bit of insight as to you know, Google's participation, what, what you've been seeing from them the last couple of years. Uh, Google's been a great partner in the Kubernetes ecosystem for Red Hat. Um, we worked really closely with them on Istio and Knative and a number of other projects. Um, I, you know, as always, um, I'm continually impressed by the ability of the folks that I've worked with um, from Google to really take a community focus and to 
concentrate on actually solving use cases. I think the, you know, there's always the the desire to create drama around technology or strategy or business and open source. You know, we're all coming together to work on you know common goals. I really want to um, you know thank the folks that I've worked with at Google over the years who've been you know, key participants. They've believed very strongly in enabling users, um, you know, regardless of um, you know business or technology. It's about making sure that we're improving software for everyone. And one of the beauties of working on an open source project like Kubernetes is everyone can get some benefit out of it. And those are really um, you know the sum of all of the individual contributions is much larger than. Um, what the simple math would apply. And I think that's, um, you know, Kubernetes has been a huge success. I want to see more successes like that, um, you know, working with Google and others in the open source ecosystem around infrastructure as a service. And, um, you know, this, this broadening domain of places where we can collaborate to make it easier for developers and operations teams and DevOps and SecOps to just get their jobs done. Um, you know, there's a lot more to do. And um, I think open source is the best way to do that. All right, well, Clayton Coleman, thank you so much for the updates. Really great to catch up. It was a pleasure. All right, stay tuned for lots more coverage. The Google Cloud Next 2020 virtually. I'm Stu Miniman. Thank you for watching theCUBE.